Welcome to Talking Transfers, a brand new show from the 90 Min Podcast Network and we're on YouTube as well. I'm Scott Saunders, joined by Harry Simeu from the Chronicles of Aguna podcast and 90 Min's transfer correspondent Graham Bailey, as well as 90 Min's top cat, head of UK content, Toby Cudworth. Please subscribe on all your major podcast platforms and follow us on Twitter too, at underscore Scott Saunders, at Harry Simeu, at Graham Bailey and at Toby underscore Cudworth. Big day today. A lot to cram into this episode as well. We've got possibly up to 20 players that we're going to discuss. Uh, Graham's had a busy morning, though, uh, with some Hugo Ekatike news. Graham, how are you doing? Morning, guys. Yeah, sweltering in the northeast today. Sweltering? How, how sweltering is sweltering? Oh, I reckon at least we'll be touching 30 soon if this carries on. Got rain in London as well for the rest of us, for Toby and Harry. Uh, Toby, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Um, it's very, very humid today, isn't it? It's not only raining, it's um, humid and sticky. Take us to the northeast, Graham. Share some of that sunshine, mate. Toby's getting killed by hay fever, but Harry, Arsenal have done a signing this week. Yeah, we're moving. We're moving. Lots of rumours as well, but I'm not getting my hopes up until things are uh, announced by the club because uh, we've been burnt before as Arsenal fans, so always wary. Uh, Fabio Vieira has come in. Arsenal also after a couple of Brazilian players, the Brazilian attackers. We'll talk about them later in the show. We'll start with Hugo Ekatike. Uh, we'll talk about Christopher Nkunku today, Anthony, among others, Osman Dembele, Rafinha. We'll do a West Ham section, probably with Declan Rice in there at some point. Uh, talk Harry Winks, Luis Suarez, Gabriel Jesus, plus anybody else who manages to pop up in between. Let's start with Hugo Ekatike. Graham, because you have been on this story for 90 min for what month are we in June? More than six months, I would say. Uh, Newcastle have wanted this lad who plays for Rem in uh, Ligue 1. They've wanted him for a long time. They came close to signing him in January. They came close to signing him in the last few weeks, but stuff's been held up. Uh, everything's been agreed, but now Newcastle have pulled the plug. Can you? explain why they've made this decision. Yeah, and they have done with a heavy heart, Scott. You know, they really like this player. Eddie Howe, this is one of the first players he identified before even coming into Newcastle back in December. And and we didn't know much about him, what has to be said, when we were covering him in January. You know, but he is one of the best teenagers, or was. He turned 20 just a few days ago, I believe. He was one of the best teenagers in Europe last season. No teenagers just scored more in the top five leagues and him a really really top talent and Newcastle thought they had this you know even up till last week a few days ago they were 80 percent certain he was coming the deal with Ream is done um the deal with the player was done but then it, as with a lot of these deals it's the extras it's a little bit it's the add-ons it's the percentage of a fee that an agent might want especially in this case and and they just couldn't get it done um you know, Newcastle have they gave it as long as they could. And and it's this is one of those deals, as we know, we could be sat here next week saying Newcastle have come back in and the, or the players had second thoughts because the player was offered a very good deal here. He's he's more than trebling his money if he went to Newcastle. And there are other clubs in for him now. We can confirm PSG are in for him. But Reem is standing firm on their asking price, which is about 26 million, a deal going to 30, which is a good deal. And whether PSG or any of the other interested clubs get to that point, we're not so sure. And so this one might not be fully dead for Newcastle. If if PSG don't meet Reims' asking price, you know, it, it may not happen. And, and are they going to offer him the terms that was on offer on time side? I'm not so sure. So, yeah, but as it stands, Newcastle have backed away. They've, they've got other targets, as we know. Um, there'll be a few coming for the next few weeks, no doubt. But, yeah, it's... it's um, it's one that got away from Newcastle, this one. They loved him, but yeah, they've had to walk away. They haven't just... You can't beat around the bush. It's a summer window now. There's only a few weeks to go before the start of the season, isn't it? What is it? Less than six weeks before the start of the season. Frightening thought. That, oh, my so God. Need, really? Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> so they need to get these players in. And so Newcastle are now looking at other targets. They've walked away. It was their decision. Um, they're disappointed, but yeah, they've taken the decision to walk away, which I think at this point is a sensible one. Just uh, before I bring Toby in on this, but Graham, I wanted to just ask about Newcastle's decision to remove themselves from this. Is this? I, I quite respect this. Actually, it's like you know, big. We're not going to be messed around. It's that. It's that kind of move, isn't it? Is this? Uh, I know you said if the agent changes his stance, uh, that 
Newcastle could come back in. And as it stands, they're out of the running. Uh, how likely do you make that to happen? Is this... We, 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 we've reported it as essentially dead in the water for this this deal at the moment, mm-hmm. but that's not yep. to say... We, that's not to say this couldn't be resurrected at some point in the next few weeks, right? Because there is a lot of time left in the transfer window, despite the season being six months away, six weeks away. Yeah, as it stands, there's no other deal on the table for him. If the agent rang up Dan Ashworth today and said, listen, I'll take this. Okay, let's do the deal. It could happen at any time. I think now that his agents will go away, they'll probably assess what options are out there. And they may come cap in hand to Newcastle later on, but they have to be careful because you know, Newcastle do have other targets. They are talking to other players. So, you know, they, they need to be careful with this as well. And I think it's a sign of Dan Ashworth really taking control of things at St. James's. You know, he's not beating around the bush. We know, obviously, that they're about to complete a deal for Nick Pope, um, the England goalkeeper, and that's for 10 million. They've already done Matt Target at 15. So Newcastle, although they had the richest club in the world, they're being very astute. That's two two very good Premier League players that are coming in for a combined fee of twenty five million. That's not bad. Yeah, Toby. Oh, sorry, sorry Scott. Go I was sorry. just going to say Newcastle almost have to do this though. They have to kind of prevent agents thinking that they can get away with murder because of the financial power that the club have. They kind of almost don't want to set a precedent, right, in terms of being sort of taking the mick out of by representatives who, who are well aware of, of their riches. So I agree with Scott. I really respect the fact that they've gone, no, uh, not going to have this and, and have essentially walked away from it. Toby, uh, Dan Ashworth, as Graham just mentioned there, uh, obviously he's been appointed by the club. It's been, you know, it's been a long time coming. It was officially confirmed a few weeks ago and now he's getting very much involved with things. Do you think this is, obviously he's a very respected figure in this kind of this line of work. Do you think this is going to set a precedent and show other agents of other players that Newcastle are just not going to be messed around? Yeah, I think we've spoken a lot about player and agent power over the past few podcasts and how that balance and dynamic is kind of shifting towards the player and away from the club. But the role of director of football or sporting director is to try and position the club in the best possible way. And Dan Ashworth did a great job at Brighton now identified a lot of promising young young talent when he was there in Newcastle, wanted him for six or seven months um, before he was allowed to sign on the dotted line at St James's. And I think he's been brought in to ensure that Newcastle do stand their ground in negotiations because, as Harry alludes to, the opportunity is now there for clubs to try and take advantage of the money that Newcastle have. And I think this is a statement that Newcastle aren't going to play ball in that way. They will be linked with dozens and dozens and dozens of players. And if they don't get Hugo Ekatike, they will get somebody else. And I have no doubt that it will be a good player that they get as well. Dan Ashworth identifies top talent. There's a lot of people doing the scouting for Newcastle. Um, I actually feel with this particular deal that this could come full circle and we'll be having another conversation in a month when PSG haven't moved for Ekatike. Uh and his agent has backed down and Newcastle are then in a, a position to complete a deal, but agreed with the point that Newcastle are, they're doing the right thing by not bowing to player demands. Cause if they set that precedent, it's very, very dangerous for the years to come. As a Manchester United fan, uh, I know, I know that feeling all too well about how things can spiral out of control. Graham on Newcastle, before we move on, what are you expecting from them this summer? Because uh, obviously like, Neymar's name has popped up in the last few days and it's the, oh, look, Newcastle are going to go and make this big fancy statement signing of a world-class player. But it doesn't seem that like they're going that way, does it? I know we talked about somebody like Harry Kane in the past who, you know, it worried to come on the market that Newcastle may want to make a statement. But what are you expecting? Because their business so far has been, I don't know what the word for it is, but, you know, modest, smart, they haven't spent too much money. Uh, how many players are you expecting them to bring in and what kind of, what profile of player are they looking at? Yeah, I think they know what they want, Scott. You know, they, they looked at a lot of players who they looked at in January. They all did very well. And I think they're quite quite stout in what they want. You know, they, they realise they want this other midfield next to Bruno. Let's not forget they've got Bruno Gamales in there who... I think next season he could be one of the stars of the Premier League. He finished the season so well. So it's crucial to get someone in next to him. 
But as well as that, they're handing out new contracts to um, Fabian Schaar and, and and Longstaff as well. It's it's a real mixture. I think it's a sign that they're not running, they're not sprinting before they can walk. You know, they're they're taking the time. I know it's to get top four. It's not going to happen next season. Maybe top eight, top six. It's it's going to be a slow process, a slow burner. But I think they are doing the sense. I think sensible is the way I would describe it. Uh, but if a deal is there, like like with Bruno, if a deal is there to be done, they will do it. So I think we can expect. Um, at least two forwards, one winger, one striker, a midfielder, and a centre half to do want. Um, I, I don't know this. I have a hunch. I think centre half wise, keeping our Nathan Aki, Eddie Howe loves this player. He signed him at Bournemouth. We know he's going to become available. We know City are trying to do Cucciarella. So Aki will be available, but there's a lot of teams who like Aki around, around Europe. But I think Newcastle will be in for him. Again, they'll only pay what it's what it, they won't go over the top with it, but yeah, I'd keep nine about a cent and a half. So, about another four players, I think we can expect Newcastle to bring in. Yes, indeed. Uh, Hugo Ekitika, one of French football's brightest prospects at the moment. Well, I mean, obviously, we've reported on nightman.com this morning, uh, Thursday morning, that the deal as it stands is off because of agent demands holding up the deal, and Newcastle just essentially are ready to move on to other potential targets. But talking of promising young French players, Christian Nkunku has signed a new contract with RB Leipzig today. And he had a number of suitors as well. I think PSG, Chelsea, Manchester United, Liverpool have all been linked with him in the past. Uh, Harry, I'll come to you first on this because he's one of the most promising attackers in Europe, had a great season last year. Uh, But are you looking at this new contract agreement and thinking that release clause of around 60 million euros or or here thereabouts is one more year here. And then you've got a relatively acceptable sum for some big club to jump in on next summer. Yeah. I think that probably comes from, you know, what the the decision to extend probably comes somewhere from a place like Nkunku is, is not a hundred percent sure about the potential suitors that are, you know, queuing up for him yes he's been linked with a lot of clubs yes from what people tell me and I I don't watch an awful lot of Bundesliga football but from what people tell me you know he was probably the best player in the Bundesliga probably the biggest talent in that division and what he's done here is he's given himself some time to think about his options whilst giving RB Leipzig what they want which is the opportunity to keep him but also the guarantee later down the line of the fact that they're going to get a decent sum in for him so I think it works for everybody at the moment. But I think if he was completely convinced on any of those clubs that were sort of knocking on the door, I think he would have pushed for the move. And the fact that he hasn't tells me that, you know, he's still a little bit on the fence about it. Interestingly as well, he talks, um, I know it's a a club interview, so you could say it's a little bit of PR and and maybe it's a little bit sanitised, but he does talk about how impressed he was by Leipzig's kind of desire to keep him and I think that that you know that goes a long way sometimes with players you want to feel wanted you want to feel loved and I think Christopher Nkunku knows that he's still got time that he's got the opportunity to move on in the future and um, and this is kind of an arrangement that that works for everybody really so I'm not as surprised as some people are that he's decided to stay on a little bit longer I think I might have just referred to him as Christian and Kunku. For I'm some afraid reason. you did, man. Chris, yeah. Christopher was, and Kunku. I'm not sure. I was going to. I was going to correct you, but I just thought, no. Let's just go with a brand new nickname. Easily done. That, yeah. That's that's me trying to shove loads of different players into my notes and rushing them through. But Graham, uh, Christopher and Kunku uh, resigns. Is PSG's interest long standing? Is that is? Do you make that the most likely destination for him? Because he's a PSG boy, isn't he? Yeah, he's one of the many players who who PSG have let go. Moves to Diaby as well. There's a, I would be having a word with my academy staff if I was PSG because it's simply letting some very good players go. Um, yeah, he he was looked at in January by PSG. I think he don't know this, but I suspect he's got the nod that PSG is going to come for him next year, and we'll see how he does. I watched him closely in the Europa. I was a bit disappointed by him, especially against Rangers. I thought he was a bit, he was a real letdown. Um, when you've seen a £70 million player, especially in that game, there wasn't many £70 million players on view. And and he was poor. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. I'm, it's it's a good move for Leipzig, obviously, um, to keep him. It, put, it keeps them up there with likes of Dortmund, Bayern, and Le- probably Leverkusen next year. So it's an interesting one, yeah. But I think he'll be, um, he'll be a big move in 2023. And we'll see how he goes. Yeah, I'd say PSG at the moment, but who knows? He might uh, come on the agenda with a few others come next 
come next summer when I suspect his release clause, I think it's gone up, Scott. I think his release clause may be towards 70 million, but we'll see. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Liverpool have been linked with him in the past. We've obviously spoken about Mo Salah's contract a number of times on this podcast over the last few weeks and months. If he leaves for free, there's a potential replacement in there lined up for Liverpool if they would like to pull the trigger. But uh, another RB Leipzig player, Conrad Leimer, is an Austrian midfielder who has been linked. Um, you know, we've reported on it on 90 min.com in the last few months when Ralph Ranick was there at Manchester United for, what, seven months or however long it was, six months, uh, trying to pull some strings. He was a big fan and is a big fan of Conrad Lima. There was some interest from Man United, but as we understand it now, Graham, Lima has essentially made it clear that he would like to join Bayern Munich. Is that the case? Yeah, United were the main interest in England. There's quite a few looking at him. He had a very good campaign last year. And I know I said to you how impressive he was. But yeah, he wants to go to Bayern Munich. Julian Nagelsmann has made it clear he wants him. And it, there's a real refresh going on at Bayern, isn't it? They've made quite a few signings, Graven back and Musrawi from Ajax and, and now Conrad Lima. I think he's an outstanding player. Um, and Taliso they've released as well, haven't they? Early, so I think there's probably a role for him there, uh, maybe a Taliso replacement. But yeah, he's made it clear he wants to go to Bayern. Nagelsmann wants him. And yeah, often when Bayern want a player in Germany, they get him. <laughs> often the case, isn't it? Uh, quickly moving on to another... Man United target, more of a recent one. We've reported on nightmint.com in the last few days of the interest in Anthony. Obviously, there was uh, other reports suggesting that the deal might have been close for around £40 million, which when we checked, we ran this, Graham, we checked up on this, it was, that was a bit of a low price, wasn't it? But uh, <laughs> we, we understand that there's been agents of Anthony in England a few weeks ago. Uh, United are still interested in him, obviously, but we all know that United are trying to do a deal for Frankie de Jong as it stands. No real movement there yet, as we understand it. But a deal for around 40 million, even if United are interested in him, is way too low because there's other players such as Richarlison and Gabriel Jesus among who are competing for the same international places in the Brazilian team, Rafinha as well. We'll talk about him later, who are much more expensive. So it doesn't really make sense that Ajax would let him go for that much money or 40 million or something around there. So if United are to pull off a deal for Anthony, it probably will be a lot more expensive than initially reported, as we understand it. But also, Graham, uh, we understand that those agents of Anthony spoke with Chelsea as well. Yeah, from what I'm told a few weeks ago, um, the agents who do a few players, let's be honest, um, with that from the start, they were in England talking to different clubs. United were one of those, letting it known that um, he might be available. We do understand Anthony does want to leave. Um, United are his preference through eight ten Hag, but that's not saying he wouldn't join anywhere else. And we do know Ant that Chelsea were in the conversation here. They were told about his availability, as you would expect. Um, we're probably not the only club, but it's an interesting one, actually, because we'll get to Dembele's situation as well. This is a position that Chelsea do want. So if they were looking for this right-sided midfielder, why wouldn't you look at Anthony? Surely you would. A player who Liverpool love as well. So it's, a, it's an interesting one, this one. We're, the story will be on site soon. Um, it, want to keep an eye on I wouldn't be surprised to see his name come up. There's so many. This right-hand side forward role. How many players are we talking about? Gabriel Jesus, Raheem Sterling, Rafinha. And so, there's about eight of them, isn't it? We're talking about them. Any, any of them could fill these roles. It's really fascinating who's going to land where. But yeah, Anthony's one who... Yeah, we need to keep down. And in terms of the fee, from what I'm hearing from Ajax, they're under no pressure to sell. So I think it's going to be 60 million upwards to get Anthony because they've, they've sold Haller, they've sold Gravenbach. Um, we understand that um, actually, I have heard a report that um, Alvarez from Ajax might be Conrad Lima's replacement, who we were just talking about. So then some more money coming to Ajax. They can't sell everyone. Can we said this on the last pod? If I was trying to sign a player from Ajax, I'd do it now because they can't sell everyone this summer. Well, United move very slowly, don't they? So it, this is going to take a few more weeks, I would imagine, if they are to tempt Anthony to come to Old Trafford. Uh, but you mentioned Dembele there, Graham. I'll bring in uh, Toby and Harry in a quick second. But Osman Dembele, out of contract at Barcelona. We are on the 23rd of June, as we record this. So it was about a week left of his contract as it stands. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chelsea have big interest in bringing him to Stamford Bridge. Barcelona would like to keep him, I would like, I want to suggest. How, how is that going to play out as it stands? 
Yeah, Xavi has, has gone to the Barcelona board in the last couple of weeks from what we understand. And he said to them, listen, let's keep Dembele. It's going to be cheaper to keep him and buy a replacement. So they've thought about it. He's had an offer on the table since December, which obviously wasn't good enough in December. It's not good enough now. I'm being told that fresh talks have taken place, but Dembele's people have made it clear to Barcelona you need to improve this offer. You need to make us a good offer. They're not saying, from what I'm told, Dembele's people are not saying you have to beat Chelsea's offer, you have to beat PSG's offer, and by Munich are hovering as well in the background here. They're just saying you have to give us a good offer. And from what I'm told, Dembele does want to stay. He loves Xavi. The last six months of the season at Barca, he was probably the best player in the league. He was sensational. But they're not close yet. They're really not. But talks are ongoing. He said he would give Barcelona until July to sort this out. There's another week to go. This one's got a few twists and turns in it yet. Um, Chelsea are still up there as favourites. But, yeah, he is talking to Barcelona again. But they need to come up with this offer. And whether they can, whether they've got the finances to do it. We don't know. As I said, with the Barcelona finances, who knows where we are? But yeah, the, but but the offer on the table in December, I, he's not going to accept a lower offer than what he's on now to stay. And he's on good money. And, and what is he? Twenty? He's only twenty three, isn't he? He's he's Dembele. probably one. Yeah, he's only, he's one of the most valued. I think he's. I'm currently very 23, 24, 23, 24. He's amazingly young. Twenty five. He's twenty five. Just 25, to, although you have you have a month's grace. He turned twenty five. Ah, there we go. Into May. There we go. So, so it amazes you how how young he is, but. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Barcelona want to keep him, they do. But hey, if we if Barcelona kept or signed every player they want, they'd have about sixty players by now, wouldn't they? <laughs> uh, let's obviously he's wanted by Chelsea, Harry, Toby, followers of other London clubs. Uh, I wanted to get let me ever come to you first, Harry, on this. There was a restructuring confirmed at Chelsea earlier this week in terms of how things will work at board level, you know, higher than the manager. Todd Bowley uh, has been confirmed as interim sporting director. How do you, uh, as an Arsenal fan, Harry, how do you uh, inject, how do you digest this? I mean, it's a, is that a bit left field? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't expect it. I thought that he would bring somebody in straight away. I, I'm not saying that he won't bring somebody in. I still think that the interim bit is the key key part of that but I thought that that would have been one of his first ports of call given that we're in the thick of a transfer window and uh, Chelsea I beg your pardon do clearly need some work I mean if you think back to the end of the season prior to the one that's just ended European champions there was big hopes for them Um, they signed Romelu Lukaku for huge huge money people were talking about them as potential title winners and it just didn't work out and there were issues off the field that contributed to that but I think we can all see that that squad needs a bit of surgery and so if I was the man going into Chelsea I think that would have been my first job it would have been to appoint someone with a proven track record who can come in and help in that department so it kind of I'm not going to say it weakens Chelsea because I can't say that he's going to make bad decisions based on just a prediction but you know I, I don't know that he's the guy to lead them forward in that sense so I'm not I look at Chelsea post Abramovich and I think that they'll still be competitive. Of course they will, because over the last 20 years, they've grown into a a really big club and a a Premier League giant. But are they going to be as competitive at this moment in time based on what I'm looking at? I'm not as fearful as I probably was a few years back. Where do you stand on that, Toby? Well, it's it's worth remembering that Marina is going to stick around until the end of the summer transfer window. So there will be a bit of a transition period and she'll still have input on Chelsea's transfer strategy between now and her departure. Um, And there were reports of Chelsea wanting to bring in Michael Edwards, former Liverpool Supremo, who's been responsible for a lot of the fantastic signings that Jurgen Klopp has made at Anfield. So I would imagine that Bailey will be in the position for a minimal amount of time and somebody will come in and then take the reins of that. But that doesn't detract that it's a bit weird for him to to even take that role on an, in an interim basis. But I can't imagine he's going to be too hands on. Really, Marina might show him the ropes for the next couple of months, but I'd imagine she'll still be in control of transfers between now and the window closing. What do you make of it, Graham? Took myself off mute. I think it's interesting. <laughs> I think um, you know, he's, from what I'm told, he's really. 
he's really getting into the football side of things. He's come from the Dodgers. It's all about trades and and stuff like that. And suddenly it's like, wait, I can I can spend money and get a player. I don't have to trade anything. I don't have to do anything. Mixture of deals with other clubs. Wow, I, I've heard he's really enjoying it. He's he's embracing it. He's moving to England for this period. He's, you know, it sounds like the opposite of Stan Kroenke, if I'm being honest. You know, he's really getting involved. And I think it's a good thing, you know. He's he's wanting to be involved in the deals, not so much saying yes or no, but he's wanting to know how to work and how the English system works. I I, I like it. I, if I was a Chelsea fan, I'd be, I'd be happy the new, new owner's getting involved. He's hands-on. You, you know, I think he's got someone like Danny Finkelstein on the board as well. He'll be, he'll be a valuable member of that board. He'll be letting them know how the system works. And so... No, I think it's um it's an interesting one. It says interim if it goes well, you know, you might you might keep it for longer. Um it's just and, and always, desperate to get in after that. Yeah, and comments, but all, all this Mar- and, and, and uh, you know, and let's not beat her on the bush. If Chelsea wanted to keep Marina, the wood, she hasn't she hasn't stepped down here. She was um um I wouldn't say she's been shoved out the door, but she's been told where the exit door is. Just uh, agreeing with the, the Stan Kroenke thing. But <laughs> Arsenal fans will tell you that, you know, he's not been uh, as involved as he probably should be. But I think there's a fine line here because you can be too involved when you don't have the skill set to actually carry out that job in the way it needs to be done. You know, like, for example, I wouldn't want Stan Kroenke making sporting decisions because he hasn't got a clue about football. So there is a danger that, yeah, you get your owner involved, but are they always the best person for the job? I'd argue that sometimes they're not. He'd rather have his son doing it, yeah. His son seems more clued up, but even still, I'd still like. I prefer the fact that Edu runs that side of things. You know that he's a football man at the end of the day, and we don't we don't always get that in our ownership. That's the problem. Harry, uh, will Edu or Josh Kroenke or Stan Kroenke end up bringing Rafinha to Arsenal this summer? What's your gut feeling on that? Uh, it's a hard one because. When I first heard of the interest, I, I was a little bit sort of sceptical of, of taking it too seriously. I thought that, yeah, you know, he's a, he's a good player and he'll add a lot to the team and, and we could really do with somebody who can provide the outputs in those wide areas more frequently than some of our young players have. They've all done great over the course of the season. But we just needed a bit more experience in that area. And then we heard that a bid had been made and I kind of got a little bit giddy and a little bit excited. You know, it looked like Arsenal were being dead serious about this and I'm not saying they're not but from what we hear and I don't know if Graham knows any more on this the the opening bid was around about 30 35 million pounds which was never going to cut it with Leeds United so I'm kind of caught in two minds here because on the one hand I think yeah we are serious in that we've gone and made a bid and I don't believe that Arsenal would do that officially without knowing that the player was interested in the move but by that same token Everybody and their dog knows that that's not enough to get him away from Leeds. So do we risk sort of irritating them a little bit? Maybe it's a bit of PTSD from an Arsenal point of view because we've done this before. I don't know. Is it a bit um, performative, do you think? You know? Oh, look, we're, we're going for him, but we're not really. I, I think one thing with this guy is the, is the relationship between Deco and Edu. And it can't be overlooked. But Toby did a piece uh, this week, actually, that there's... There's a lot of interest in London in Rafinha. Um, you can fill us in, Toby. It's, yeah. um, there's, there's a bit of a battle going to be happening here. Chelsea and Tottenham are also keeping their eye on this situation, not closely because both teams are looking at a number of players. So they're not close to making a move for Rafinha, but they're, they're eyeing him up and they're monitoring what Leeds are, are asking for. And Arsenal's bid is strange, to say the least. West Ham made a £50 million bid at the end of January and that was turned down and whether or not... People want to think that was a serious bid or not. It was made. It was rejected by Leeds. Um, so for Arsenal to go in under that amount seems strange to me, given what Rafinha then managed to do in the final few months of the season. And he, he had a couple of injury problems, I think, but he still scored 10 or 11 goals for Leeds, scored a penalty on the final day, kept them up and is clearly their best player alongside Calvin Phillips. And West Ham still retain... A vague interest. We understand that Barcelona is Rafinha's preferred destination. That's what Deco would like to try and engineer if possible, regardless of his close ties to Edu. But it's going to take at least 55 million to get him out of Ellen Road, possibly up to 65 million. That's been a, a figure that's been reported elsewhere. So if Arsenal are serious, they've really got to up it, but they're not the only ones in for him. There's a good four or five teams looking and there could be other teams that come in. 
you know, there's still two months to go. Things change in the transfer window, priorities change, and Rafinha is a player who brings a lot, or would bring a lot to any team. I think there's a report coming out of Brazil. Um, I'm not sure if it was late last night or this morning. I think it's from Goal in Brazil, who are saying that Rafinha has indicated that he'd prefer to go to Arsenal over some of the other clubs that have been linked. Now, I don't know if I'm not saying that that's true, but what I'm saying is, could there be a link between the player's preference and then why Arsenal have felt that they can go in with this bid that can be described maybe as derisory to a degree because they know that the player is going to push from his side? I don't know. If you're not watching on, on YouTube, by the way, uh, Graham did make some kind of scrunched up face at that uh, Arsenal preference comment. Uh, I, I I believe that Rafinha is open to a number of clubs. You know, I, I think London he would like to go to. I, but as Toby said, there's a few coming in. I, I wouldn't rule Newcastle out of this long term. You know, people looking at this, there's going to be Richarlison, Rafinha on the market. There's so many different players available here. I don't think we can put United in the Rafinha hunt. I think he loves... Leeds or purports to love Leeds too much to go to Manchester United, so I don't think that would happen. But yeah, it's a really interesting. I I think the the Deco and Edu thing. If Rafinha was to go to Arsenal, that would be key. But as it stands, as Toby said, we understand that um, Deco is desperate to get him to Barcelona. He really is. But hey, who who, who knows what's going on there? The minute Barcelona, Barcelona, they hold the ace in the pack here. They they're key to so many deals, aren't they? Lewandowski. Sterling, Rafinha, um, De Jong, Barcelona hold, they're really at the centre of the transfer universe in Europe at the minute. It's, um, yeah, we'd like to know what's going, going on there, but we'll find out next. I think start July, we're going to find out an awful lot about Barcelona. Well, yeah, let's make no mistake about it. Barcelona can't do anything right now until Frankie De Jong goes to Manchester United. They need to sell him to get some funding. Um, so this Rafinha chat is probably going to go on for a few weeks while Barcelona sort themselves out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Man United fans melting down about how long this is taking, but uh, as I pointed out on other podcasts, Frankie de Jong isn't going to join United pre-season training until the second week of July anyway mm -hmm. uh, to go yeah. on tour with them. So United do have, like, is, do they really need to close this deal tomorrow? Maybe, maybe they do for the other deals that they'd like to pull off, but, you know, if uh, Eric Ten Hag wants De Jong part of his squad, I mean, he, they, United still have time to pull that off. As frustrating as it is to watch United, t t uh, you know, drag their heels over a transfer as it's uh, happened so many times in the past, Jaden Sancho, Harry Maguire, etc., etc. But back to West Ham, Toby. Uh, I've titled this the West Ham section. Is there a Deccan Rice comment to make today? Uh, uh... And is there interest... In a couple of Italian players, um, what's the latest on Keen Lewis Potter as well? That's four questions. Here. Right, okay. So Declan Rice, number one, not going anywhere. <laughs> no change on that particular situation. He will be West Ham's captain next season. But West Ham do want to strengthen and they want to bring in a lot of players in many various positions. Naya Fagued is in. We've spoken about that on the podcast already. A deal worth just shy of 30 million plus add-ons. Five-year contract for a centre-back who can also play left-back. West Ham wants a goalkeeper, which we believe will be Alphonse Ariola. once West Ham were able to compromise on his rather excessive wages at PSG. Had a successful loan spell last year, even though he was the cup goalkeeper, and I think he is seen as the long-term number one. Um, but West Ham needs a central midfielder, uh, and they need forwards. They need a striker to support Mikel Antonio, because ever since Sebastian... Alaire left to go to Ajax in January 2021. Antonio has been a lone ranger. Unfortunately for West Ham, hasn't had any serious injury niggles. But West Ham are looking at many players and they're scouting Serie A quite heavily. And we posted a story yesterday that West Ham's scouting team and head of recruitment, Rob Newman, have been looking at Sassuolo's front duo of Giacomo Raspadorian, Gianluca Scamacca, who... Uh, Harry will know Arsenal have been linked with in the past few weeks. There's no indication that these players are absolutely available, but uh, Sassuolo did make a signing last week uh, for a young Uruguayan forwards who is uh, dubbed by some to be the next Darwin Nunes. Make of that what you will. Um, and these are both fully... Is Darwin Italy. Nunes is the new Darwin Nunes. No, Darwin Nunes. He's made it now, Scott. Once you've mm. gone to the big club, that's it. You are, you're moved aside and someone else is now your new version. Um, 
and that's who this kid that Sassuolo have signed has been dubbed as. Uh, but Raspadori and Scamacca are both playing for for Italy under Roberto Mancini. They're both getting regular minutes. Scored 10 goals and 16 goals, respectively, in Serie A last year. So they know where the back of the net is. But West Ham also looking at Giovanni Simeone. Talks have been held with intermediaries about moving him to the London Stadium. Uh, yes, he is the son of Diego, in case you were wondering. And also Beto from Udinese. So plenty of forwards that West Ham want to bring in uh, from abroad, abroad, sorry, but also domestically. Keen Lewis Potter on the radar of a number of clubs, Brentford, among others. But West Ham, we understand, are still heading the chase for him. Um, Watford, incidentally, have also come in for him, we're led to believe, and have had a bid turned down with new boss Rob Edwards at the helm. But West Ham are very much pushing for him. And as we've alluded to already, Rafinha is still there. If it didn't work out going to a bigger club or somebody didn't want to pay, West Ham, are, they're not fully taking their eye off that deal. Um, it would be a surprise, given the interest in him, but he could end up at West Ham. You never know. Talking of Watford briefly there, uh, just a quick note about uh, Daniel Backman, goalkeeper, who was uh, attracting interest from Manchester United, reliably informed by Watford fan Jacob Culture in the office yesterday that Eric Ten Hag tried to bring him to Ajax uh, when he was at Ajax. Uh, has good distribution numbers to wide areas, fullbacks, etc., etc. And uh, yeah, maybe that one will end up happening. I don't think we've put anything out on that yet, Graham, but uh, we might end up doing something. No, what, what, I think we're going to visit Watford. Week. We're going to visit Watford quite a lot in the next few weeks. Shmili Sa, uh, Emmanuel Dennis, uh, João Pedro, um, all three probably leaving. So we may be talking quite a bit of Watford in the coming weeks. Well, let's uh, let's talk midfielders now because uh, Jeannie Wijnaldum uh, is a player who left Liverpool, maybe Harry, I'll, I'll come to you here. How have you sum up, summarised his uh, p- time at PSG? I know you, you, you're you mainly a Premier League watcher, uh, but obviously White Album was one of the best midfielders in the Premier League for a long time at Liverpool. Uh, went to PSG, has really lost his way, lost his place. And now uh, we understand that Leicester have some interest in bringing him back to the Premier League. Uh, do you? Th- is this something you maybe expect to happen? Um, it could happen, you know. It, how I'd, I'd describe his time at PSG, underwhelming is the answer to that because he was sensational for Liverpool for a number of years. He was key to a lot of the success that they had. Um, and, and it surprised me that he went to PSG and it didn't really work out. But it just goes to show that if you're at the wrong club, if you don't have the right manager, if you don't have the right trust put in you, then, you know, it's it's actually a lot easier to fail than, than people normally think so yeah I, I think he's been underwhelming at PSG and I think if he could move back to the Premier League I think he'd definitely be interested you know you've got to remember he wasn't just good at Liverpool he was good at Newcastle as well prior um, you know to, to that move so he's not just somebody who can only really mix it at a big club like he can drop down a level or two and still be a very effective operator so I think if Leicester could nab him that would be a brilliant signing and, and I think he'd be a good addition to the Premier League again. What's your understanding, Graham, of uh, Leicester's interest in Wijnaldum? And also, we'll talk, uh, feel free, if you want to jump into the latest on Glenn Kamara as well, uh, feel free to do so. Yeah, um, so Leicester are looking around for midfielders. We know Yuri Tielemans has been talking to Arsenal. They're ready to let him go. That one stalled a little bit whilst Arsenal are doing others. I still expect Tielemans probably to go. I think it's probably trying to negotiate the fee down even further. But Leicester are looking. Yeah, Vinaldo has been offered around the Premier League. It seems he wants to go. PSG, again, I think it's one of these moves. We've seen a few, a bit like Lukaku. Although, actually, no, it, it, was, the wrong, it was always the wrong club. For Vinaldum, I think, and you know, he almost went to Barcelona. He's a player who does need the right club, and he was so good, wasn't he? He was, he's so good and under Jurgen Klopp. It wouldn't surprise me to see Liverpool come back in from at some point. You know, they've got a, a, some veteran midfielders there: Henderson, Milner, Vinaldum could come in there. It wouldn't surprise me. I have seen that link, so we'll keep nine Vinaldum. The story going up soon um, on site on him as well. In terms of Glen Kamara, yeah, we can reveal that Brighton. Of an interest in Glenn Kamara. Um, he's one of the players they are considering as a replacement for Eve Basuma. Glenn Kamara, who was fabulous for Rangers in that run to Europa League final. And on the back of that, there is a lot of Bundesliga interest in Glenn Kamara. 
and so they should be. He was fantastic against Leipzig, Dortmund, and Frankfurt in the final. And Leipzig, he is also a name being considered as a Lehmer replacement, um, who is getting a lot of mentions on the show today. But yeah, but Brighton, very astute in transfer market. And I, when I was told this one, it was one of those where you think, yeah, that 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 would make an awful lot of sense. Glenn Kamara to replace Basum in that midfield, only 26. He wouldn't cost an awful lot of money in terms of ranges, you know, still probably double figures, but we're not talking 30, 40 million here. So, yeah, um, Glenn Kamara is on Brighton's list. There's a few other clubs as well. Um, Southampton sniffing around. Leeds had a look as well. So, um, let, let's get Harry's opinion. Obviously, a former Arsenal starlet, Glenn Kamara, Harry. Yeah, um, never really made the cut at Arsenal and, and obviously made that move. And, you know, he's he's done really, really well. I, I think he'd be a good option for a lot of clubs in the centre of midfield. I'm still always wary, though, and I don't want to come across as though I'm being disrespectful to the Scottish League um, because I'm not intending to do that at all. But I'm still always wary of how that that level of competition equips you to then make that transition. I think we've seen some examples where it's really worked. I mean, to cite an Arsenal example, Kieran Tierney has come in and has been excellent Mm -hmm. having come from Scottish football. So, you know, it can work. And I think the good thing about being at a big club like Rangers or Celtic is that although the the level of the league is not quite as high, you get used to being under pressure. You're used to having to win every single week. The the big club element is the same. Um, So it does equip you well in one way, but I do think the step up is massive. And will he be as effective in the Premier League as he is in the SPL? I, I think there's a question mark over that. But I think given what we've seen of him and given what he'd probably be available for, I think it's probably a, a risk worth taking. You can check that story out on nightmin.com. And another story you can check out on nightmin.com, which has gone live as we record this, is Harry Winks, the latest future, latest on the future of Harry Winks. Uh, Tottenham have obviously signed Eve Basuma in the last few days. They already have uh, Hoiberg and Benton Cure in the midfield area. Harry Winks, who was one time, maybe maybe I'll get a laugh from Harry here, hailed as uh, you know one of the brightest prospects, brightest midfield prospects in English football. And he scored a goal from miles out once as well, but that was after his uh, initial breakthrough, wasn't it? That was more didn't Jose, it was on that pri- the Prime documentary where Jose was singing his praises. We had clips of it, didn't we, of him singing his praises. <laughs> I can't remember what he did. He was talking to Daniel Levy about him, wasn't he, saying how good he was? Yeah, uh, and it's, it's not really worked out for him in more recent months, obviously. Uh, now, Tottenham have a lot of options in midfield. They're looking to potentially raise some money in return for them to fund other deals, I would imagine. Leicester City also in for him. We've talked about Leicester interest in Gini Wijnaldum there, but uh, Leicester in for Harry Winks, along with Everton, Crystal Palace, Brentford and Wolves. Uh, is this the end of the road at Spurs for Harry Winks, Graham? It would seem so. And obviously, let's not forget the Christian Eriksen interest, which is still there for Spurs. And I think if they manage to move Winks on, um, that would help with that deal. He's on a lot of money. Um, but, you know, we're talking about a player with a lot of ability and, and 10 England caps as well. Um, but, yeah, it's a, tw- it's a curious one. The teams linked to are ones that I can see. Everton, Wolves, Wolves need a midfielder. They've just missed out on Enzo Fernandes, obviously. Um, Leicester, yeah, you can see this. And I think it's interesting to see Brentford linked. I think it'd be... It'd be an excellent sign for Brentford, and possibly his next in replacement if if he doesn't stay there. So there's a lot of interesting options for him here. It'd probably have to be a loan because he isn't a lot of money. But yeah, um, I, but he needs to be careful. Wings. This this next move is crucial, as we saw with Deli Ali, who's uh, who accepted the move to Everton. Yeah, you, you'd be aware maybe these moves to Merseyside under Frank Lampard. I think he'll be talking to Deli Ali. So mm, I'm I'm a little bit skeptical about the Everton one. I'm not sure that would be the wisest decision for Harry Winks. I've just had a genius brainwave, Toby. Mark Noble. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Declan Rice, maybe. No, no, we don't. Look, Harry Winks isn't a bad player. I just, I think he's a bottom half Premier League player. I'll be honest. I think his his breakthrough was he was really good in his early days at Tottenham, but he's not pushed on, and he's now twenty six years old. There's been no real improvement, you'd argue, in the last three or four years, and he struggled with injuries. Um, it's a lot of money to take on wage-wise. So a loan deal is possibly the only way that that would appeal. But I would, I'd agree with Graham. I think Brentford or somebody similar is a good landing spot for 
for Harry Winks, and he can um, he can stay away from West Ham. I think it's been too, this has been too harsh a section on Harry Winks, unfortunately. <laughs> so Harry, I'm not going to come to you on this because it's not going to get any better, is it? Uh, as an Arsenal fan, uh, let's move on to another midfielder that uh, we understand. Well, Wolves have now missed out on. Uh, Fernandez of River Plate, Enzo Fernandez. Uh, I believe he's been confirmed by Benfica as a new signing. Uh, we reported earlier this week that there was interest from Wolves in the player, as well as uh, Gabriel Barbosa, Graham. Yeah, Wolves made a, made a real concerted effort to get Enzo Fernandez. Matthew Hobbs, I think it's Hobbs, uh, their senior scout, flew down to Buenos Aires to try and get the deal done. Um, but Benfica had already made the move um, and the player has turned Wolves down to go to Benfica. George Mendes was involved. Um, they had a chance of getting it. I think the player thought long and hard about it. You know, it's an, it's an offer to go to the Premier League. It's not easily turned down, but he's accepted the move to Benfica. He'll be staying at River Plate, I understand, during the Copa Libertadores campaign. But yeah, a former team out of Junior Alves won't be following him to the Premier League. But as well as um, Fernandes, we do understand that the Wolves were talking to Flamengo about a player who I know Toby loves, um, Gabriel Barcel- Barbosa, known as Gabigol. Still, and he is only 25, which I find massively He's been amazing. forever, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot of interest still in this guy. Remember, we talked about the Brazil national team in terms of the right-hand side, and we've got Vinny Jr. left. Gabigol is often the number nine for Brazil, and he still wants to go to the World Cup. He's still got a very good chance of being at number nine. They don't have many central strikers, and he is one of them. He's one of the better ones. But, yeah, there is interest in England again. Wolves like him. They've had talks, but don't be surprised to see a few more teams. I think Villa, Newcastle, even the West Ham maybe. Um, and we saw, I'm surprised even Arsenal haven't been linked yet. Um, there's a bit more to come from Gabigol this summer. It's not a transfer window without Gabigol, and he is here now. Yeah, uh, as we've mentioned on this show uh, with previous players like uh, Lima and uh, different, different, there's a bunch of different options that we've already talked over. There's a lot of players on a lot of lists of different clubs and a lot of it is off, obviously a bit of a jigsaw. You know, things can move, things can change quite often. Uh, and yeah, you'll get an understanding for that, I would imagine, and a feel for that over the next few weeks of talking transfers. We're on twice a week at the moment on YouTube and all of your major podcast platforms. Uh, but you mentioned a Brazilian striker there. Uh, not many options. There's nobody who's actually sealed that position. We'll talk Gabriel Jesus at the end of the show. But what I'd, what I'd like to do before we do, quick section on Luis Suarez. Uh, and I'm going to jump back to Graham again because it looked at one point that Aston Villa were getting close to this deal. But now we understand he's turned that opportunity down to work again with Steven Gerrard. Yeah, and uh, bringing River Plate back up, he's he's heading to Argentina. He's going to take a chance to go to River Plate. I think it's quite a sensible move. It'll get him fit, get him ready for the World Cup because I, th- I still he, he is wanting to go to the World Cup. I believe I'm not in, fully in, uh, versed on Uruguay's squad, but I do believe he's still in the mix there. So yeah, it's an interesting move, isn't it, for him? He could have gone to MLS. He could have gone to Villa. Uh, with Steven Gerrard, I don't think he would have been first choice at Villa. No, I think he would have been playing a bit part. Um, so I think that's probably the reason why he wouldn't have been starting every game. So I think that's probably the reason why he's decided to go down to River Plate, an interesting option, and obviously means that River Plate will, won't be pursuing Anderson Cavani anymore, Scott, because he was a player who um, was in their sights as well. Unless they do go double Uruguayan, um, I'm ruling that out maybe a bit early. You know, Cavani Suarez front line could be quite tempting, but yeah, it looks that looks unlikely now. But yeah, River Plate, Luis Suarez, and I, that's a shame. I was quite looking forward to Luis Suarez coming back to the Premier League, but yeah, he's now heading back to South America. It seems that is one we will not be seeing. Uh, I'll let's round the show off with uh, Gabriel Jesus. We'll do a decent section on this. Harry, uh, obviously Arsenal, very much in the running for Gabriel Jesus at the moment. Uh, you can read nightymin.com for the latest on him and whether we've got a story out now or whether that'll be coming out quite soon but uh and we understand that uh obviously Arsenal want Gabby Jesus and he is after a central striking role that that central striking role that uh we've talked about and mentioned just briefly a few minutes ago Arsenal it appears are the only club in Europe willing to offer him that position uh now I'll come to Graham and Toby in a minute but is this the position that Arsenal need to fill? Obviously, Eddie and Ketia has left as a uh, signed a new contract this week. Is he the right fit for this role? 
for me he is um he, he brings so much to the table in terms of the way he can link up the way he can offer threat in behind the way he can run channels the way he can drift into wide positions um i think that it's been very clear that Mikel Arteta has a big emphasis on the pressing game. And I think Gabriel Jesus is, is well equipped to do that and help in that aspect as well in the way that Lacazette just couldn't. You know, we saw in the last few games of the season how well Eddie Nketiah did that particular side of things. And, and Gabriel Jesus is a player that I think can come in and do that as well. I think this whole thing about him being offered sort of the central striking role and that Arsenal are the only club that are willing to do that, I think is interesting because there was a lot of talk earlier in the week that actually he didn't want to be a centre forward. Um, I think it was Tim Vickery was talking about it on Sky Sports and on a couple of other bits and pieces. And he was saying that, you know, Gabriel Jesus wants to play from a wide area. I've never believed that. I've always said that this is a guy who came in to Manchester City with the view to being the next big thing at centre forward. And maybe because of a bit of a lack of confidence, maybe because of a lack of trust in him from the management, he's found himself playing in other positions. And people have seen that he can do that and seen that versatility and gone, actually, maybe this is the position for him going forward. But I think he's always wanted to play through the middle. I think that going to Arsenal gives him an opportunity to build up his confidence again in that position and to compete for that spot in the Brazilian national side. I think... It's not so much about him just playing at centre forward at Arsenal. It's about him being a focal point of the project. He's always been, as I've said before, the bridesmaid. Now it's his turn to be the bride. And in Mikel Arteta, he's got someone who he trusts, who he's worked with before, and who clearly understands what the player wants and needs to feel like this is the right place for him. Um, there has been sort of rumours that personal terms have been agreed there's figures around about 220, 230,000 pounds a week being talked about. I can't verify that, but that's kind of the general sort of feeling at the moment. But I think this is a great fit. And I think if Arsenal can get this over the line, it's a bit of a statement because there's a lot of people that have been saying, you know, why would he want to go to Arsenal? Why would anyone of that status want to go to Arsenal, uh, given where they are uh, in the pecking order at the moment? You get Gabriel Jesus over the line. You send out a message to the rest of Europe that we are moving in the right direction. We're still a big club and we've still got pulling power. And I think that's so important. Pulling power, Toby, for Manchester City's second choice striker and uh, not a frequent fixture in their first team apart from the back end of last season. You had to, uh, didn't you? you had <laughs> just, to. just had you to had do to. that. Uh, Toby, do you think that Arsenal's... Obviously, we know that Nicolas Pepe, that transfer has not gone to plan. We know that Lacazette's left the club. We know that Nketi has re-signed. But it does appear that Arsenal are looking for a right forward or a right winger and a striker. Do you think that the interest in both Rafinha and Gabi Jesus essentially confirms that? Because we know Rafinha's a right winger, don't we? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, it begs the question where Bukayo Saka will be playing his football next season. What position? Not in terms of what club. I know he's been linked with the move away and that that won't happen. But Saka, for me, is a lock-in on the right wing. Um, and Emil Smith-Rowe didn't get much of an opportunity last year, despite impressing. He scored double-digit Premier League goals, but he wasn't always a regular fixture under Arteta. Um, would Rafinha go in and go on the left? You'd have thought not, because he played the entirety of the season for Leeds on the right. In terms of whether Jesus is the right fit as centre-forwards, I don't think he is, but you do have to look at it and think who is out there and who is available. Jesus has got a lot of Premier League experience. He is an elite level player. I think he's a world-class right winger and he is a good centre forward. He's, he did that job for Manchester City for the first two or three years of his career at the Etihad. He was just playing down the middle as Aguero's understudy. But I don't think he'll ever be a 20, 25 goal striker. But maybe that's not what Mikel Arteta wants. Maybe he wants a 10, 12 goal striker who links the play up, as Harry says, and allows the right wing, the left wing, the number 10 role to flourish and to also chip in. Um, it's clear, though, that Arsenal need to, or Arteta wants two players to come in and, and bolster. I would presume Nicolas Pepe is going to be heading out of the Emirates providing they can find a taker, a loan deal, I'd imagine, because his wages are... Not easy. Yeah. Um, what was he? £72 million, Harry? Yeah, £72 million. Pound. Interestingly, he's he's changed representatives this summer um, with a view to 
getting that move away. I think, listen, it, Arsenal have shown over the last couple of years that they've, they, they've acknowledged that they've made mistakes in the past and they've kind of been quite good, I would say, and ruthless in, in the sense of, well, we've made this mistake. We've just got to swallow the consequences of it now. So I wouldn't be surprised if they take a hit on the fee for Pepe, um, you know, in order to, to get that move done, if indeed there is the interest. Graham, uh, final say on Gabby Jesus. Obviously, Harry mentioned there that he has his doubters, or Arsenal have their doubters. Uh, why would Gabby Jesus want to join Arsenal, as Harry's mentioned there? But um, that was your position. Has that changed at all? Is there, would, you, would you make the likely competitors for Gabriel Jesus' signature? Yeah, I think it, the at the moment it's more likely to come from abroad. It'd be interesting to see what happens if Dembele stays at Barcelona. I'd be amazed if Chelsea weren't in the picture then. I think, I'll be honest, I think of all the suitors, I think he suits Chelsea down to the ground. But did they, did they have more of an interest in Raheem Sterling? Um, it's a really interesting way. I think, and that's why Arsenal are really pushing this. I think Arsenal are looking at this as well, thinking we need to get this one done. We need to get over the line. For the same reason, I think De Jong and United, this is their statement signing. I think it'll fire war into the rest of the clubs, but I think Arsenal need to get this done quickly. The longer it goes without being done, there's going to be more suitors coming in here um, and more people looking. But yet, but as I said, we understand that as, as it is, the only club who are willing to play him centrally, because Chelsea won't play him centrally if they signed him, they won't, they'll be playing him on the right. So if he wants to play down the middle, which we believe that is the main thing about this move for him, he wants to play centrally, then Arsenal are the ones. But Arsenal as well, fair play to them. They're showing him some love, aren't they? They're, they're, they're willing to pay the money. They're willing to do the deal. And I don't think we can underestimate that when it comes to these players, high-profile players who like their uh, temperament to be <laughs> to be stroked. You know, they they like to be wanted. And that's what Arsenal are doing here. They're saying, look, we put our money where our mouth is. We're offering you a big contract. Come and play for Arteta. And that relationship between his and Arteta can't be underestimated either. You know, they 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 were close when they were at City. So yeah, I think um it is looking that way. And obviously I don't think he's a he's a sixty million pound number nine, but hey, he, he might prove me wrong. He, he's still only quite young, here's us, you know. Again, we talk about how young some players are. He's he's what he's twenty four still. Remark, <laughs> Graham, this is this is a new thing. Maybe we'll have to put a section in this of Graham guessing the ages of players. <laughs> is, is that tw- I think it's, isn't he 24, 23, he's, 24? He's, 25. he's also tw- he's also twenty five. Another one. In oh, is it, has, has, <laughs> has, 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 has he just turned twenty five? Uh, that- two months April. ago, April. Oh, there, oh, there we go. Yes. You get a two um, month reprieve for this one. Though. Yeah, the, I think um, uh, the age as well. But Arsenal, you can see why. The, you would pay 60 million, no, can't you, Harry? Because at the age of 25, you're locking in the investment. But obviously, as we see with Nicholas Pepe in these contracts, the, the long contracts make it the, every year goes by, it makes it harder to get them out of the club as well, as they are experiencing with Pepe. But yeah, I, as it stands now, he is heading to Arsenal here as well. But I think they do, they are wary, they're not, they need to get this done, done as soon as they can. There we go. Any final words, Toby, Harry, or should we wrap it there? We're closing in on an hour's worth of football transfer news for you if you're listening or watching on YouTube. Uh, speak now or forever. Hold your peace. I'm getting shaking heads. So I, th- I think we're done. I think we're done. We better move on to actually manage the website. I'm sure Harry's got to pump out some Arsenal content today. Uh, Harry manages our podcast network uh, fantastically well uh, and has... Uh, played a big role in getting talking transfers off the ground as well so a uh, big thanks for that and it's always good to have you on as well harry graham toby thank you very much for joining listener thank you very much for listening and for watching as well please subscribe on all your major podcast platforms and follow us on twitter too at underscore scott saunders at harry simu at graham bailey and at toby underscore cudworth we'll be back next week for some more talking transfers